Sport England's Great Ideas Fund offered up a real opportunity for organisations to propose innovative approaches to addressing inequalities in sport. And it's through this initiative the Coaching for All project was born. Just what is Sporting Communities? We are values, equality, opportunities. Always included, never secluded. Standards one, we are all equal. Coaching is for all people. Together on earth, we're as big as the universe as we strive to be ethically diverse. Breaking down barriers, as we expand our range, supporting each other as a catalyst for change. As time departs from lockdown, let's lock out the hate. Whoever you are, let's combine and demonstrate. The virus has been a setback, now it's time for the get back. Return to play, unite the movement today. Coaching careers alongside volunteers, sport and physical activities bring back the crowd's cheers role models to encourage, support and steer. It's time to listen, we'll lend you an ear. The vision of the project is to provide an insight on the movement we intend to unite. Let us use our platform to make noise on the mic and share bright ideas that could light up the night. We represent the underrepresented. Join us as we get started. Sport can bring us together. It binds us and gives us the opportunity to rejoice and celebrate each other no matter who you are, what your background is, your culture, race or any other protected characteristic. But it hasn't been without its controversy over the years. Sporting Communities set up uh, almost nine years ago now in 2012 and we are an ethical uh, not-for-profit CIC uh, that operates predominantly across the Midlands um, but are broadening out across the country. The idea behind the direction of Sporting Communities was that we wanted to listen to communities to learn how we can work with them to serve their needs. So we go into a community, we identify what the uh, needs or wants of that community are with them and then work with them to co-produce a solution for that. Um, obviously sport is quite a key driver for influencing change and is high on a lot of people's agenda so that is a, a, a high priority and focal point of a lot of our work uh, and we also find that one of the things that sport does really well is that it creates an, env an, an inviting atmosphere so that people are likely to come and join in in sports activities and then if it is that we identify that there are additional needs uh, such as training and development as has been with this project then we can implement those with the community. So Sporting Communities works in a lot of um, disadvantaged communities and a number of the communities that we work in are also quite diverse communities in terms of ethnicity and when we were working with predominantly young people and refugees um, the feedback that we were getting is that a lot of the uh, participants in our sports activities wanted to be like our coaches and they aspired to and see, saw them as, as role models when we asked the question as to whether they um, 
saw themselves becoming a coach, there was almost a little bit of hesitation around um, the fact that they didn't really see that as a, as a, a potential career option. Um, so we, we decided to delve into that a little bit more and try and understand why it was that um, that was the case. Uh, and we ended up applying to the Great Ideas Fund to do a research uh, program around that. Some of the wider research that we'd um, explored seemed to suggest that there was actually an overrepresentation of ethnically diverse uh, coaches within the entirety of the coaching workforce. So that including volunteers, paid workers, um, and also those in like teaching professions who are doing PE, for example. Um, but when it came to actual paid workers in coaching itself, um, there seemed to be a huge underrepresentation in those that were non-white um, or non-white British anyway. So uh, the application to the Great Ideas Fund was to try and unravel why that was the case. Um, and we weren't making any um, preconceptions about the reasons for that. Was it that it was um, maybe that people didn't see it as a career option, that they uh, there was cultural barriers or was it that there was a lack of opportunity? Uh, we wanted to, again, listen to what the feedback from uh, participants was in order to make decisions and, 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 and um, offer advice around how we thought we could implement change if there was even a requirement to do so. Throughout the documentary, we are joined by many different people from sporting communities, staff members, partners of the project, sports clubs, national governing bodies, inspirational guest speakers from the project and aspiring coaches themselves. It's important that we get all perspectives from the coaches on the ground right up to the managing directors. Based on the research, there is an underrepresentation of ethnically diverse population in paid coaching. However, there is a fair representation on voluntary coaching roles. Why do you think there is an underrepresentation specifically in paid coaching? I think one of the main reasons is you have to get appointed to the role, so it's quite hard to get through interview process, selection, etc. Um, I don't think it's any lack of qualification. I think there's lots of people who are more than qualified, but perhaps they don't get the opportunities that they might. Whereas in volunteering, if you're a volunteer, and you come along to offer your skills and capability to support a team. I don't know many cricket teams or clubs at the moment that wouldn't welcome you with more open arms. So I, I think that's probably the reason. Um, I think there's one other possible reason is that for many groups, um, coaching certainly isn't seen as a career opportunity, as it might be with other jobs. So I've heard many people who talk about coaching say to me, when are you going to get a proper job? Um, they don't see it always as a proper job. So that might be one of the one of the reasons as well. I was sitting once having um, a meal with someone and they said, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a coach. And they said, no, no, what do you do for a living? What do you do for, for your job? And I said, that's what I do for my job. And it, it's so different in America. I used to work over there quite a lot. And if I went over there, I'd be picked up by a limousine and I'd be someone holding up my name and say, Coach Neil. And I was quite well respected in America, but come over here, it was like, well, yeah, that's what you do for fun and voluntary, but how do you earn your money? So it might also be a bit around perception as well. What is the demographic makeup of the participants in your sport or club? So in terms of the participants, um, we have 1,500 people playing table tennis a week across 70 sessions, this is pre-lockdown, um, and it's 30 to 35 percent um, uh, BAME communities in those sessions. Um, I think it's, it's quite interesting if you look at the different age groups, lots of our 50 plus sessions are um, quite white, um, but then if you go to some of our sessions in, in certain schools and, and, and after school clubs, then you know, it kind of changes as you, as you look at the different age groups. At the school level with the juniors, um, we've got 54% um, come from the BME community. Um, and then I think it was 60% of the last count were, were female. Um, now, we work with lots of um, state schools, like I mentioned, and we try and see every pupil in the state school. So 
so our numbers just reflect back what what's going on in the school um and that that puts us in rowing as you like probably imagine that puts us a long way ahead of in terms of um the ratios of diversity involved it's a long way ahead of the sport so at the moment you've got four percent of british rowing members are from a bme background so we're we're sort of moving the dial there um and we're, we're probably i would say within rowing at least we're probably known for the fact that we're the club that probably most similarly represents the community that we we operate in yeah we we have a very small amount of participants from a uh, an Asian background, but we have a very large amount of participants from a, a black background and 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 white background. So that's probably the the two areas where we've got uh, our, our highest representation. Whereas, sort of from the Asian community, we we struggle in still to uh, get participation, get interest from people in that in that area. I would say there is an underrepresentation of ethnically diverse communities, uh, particularly when we look at the participant base of the sport um, which again athletics is quite well, very broad um, so it can be quite varied so um, particularly within some of the track and field event groups so looking at, at sprints and, and jumps um, then there's much better representation there when it comes to ethnically diverse communities but um, particularly when we look at throws or endurance running particularly off track endurance um, running then there's a I suppose there's a bit more of a mixture there. Um, ultimately, it's it's tricky because we collect information, but um, it's not particularly accurate at the moment because it relies on individuals sharing that information. So we've got a lot of work to do and supporting people to understand why we're asking that information and that it helps us to make the sport more diverse because we can really pinpoint where the inequalities lie and therefore which you know which part of the sport to put our kind of resources into improving those inequalities. What is the demographic makeup of your coaching force, voluntary and paid as well, please? Well, nearly all of our coaches are paid. Uh, in fact, all of our coaches are paid. And only one of them is not white, which is like so it's reflected exactly the problem that we're talking about. Um, um, yeah, so so we're not a great shining example of what's happening in coaching, but I think what we have done is recognise that and we're, we're trying to do something about it. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's tough. Yeah, so on the paid side, we don't have too many paid coaches, um, but a couple of the paid coaches are tagged in with the uh, contract to, to play basketball as well. So we have a, a couple of people that are a couple of players that are from an ethnic minority background that are, are paid to to play and coach. Uh, we've been really pleased over the last uh, three or four years that we've got more female coaches that have become involved in in coaching the club, and that's partly because we've uh, increased our female participation levels. So some of the females that previously uh, came through our, our programme are now getting into coaching as they as they move out the other end sort of thing. So that's been a real positive kind of in the diversity side of things. Uh, we've got a, a couple of coaches that are European uh, that have been really good. Uh, that have uh, we've got one of our coaches is from Turkey who's been been excellent, um, and we've got a couple of coaches that are from a Bain background as well. So in terms of the, the overall um, range of people on our, on our coaching uh, side of things, we've got quite a, quite a wide range. But of course, I think we'd, we'd like to increase that even further. So when it comes to the, the coaches, um, it's, it's a similar sort of uh, picture, I think, as it is to participant base. So we do have um, underrepresentation from ethnically diverse communities. But again, that varies very much between... Uh, the event group within athletics um, and also the level of coaching qualification so again what we're finding is the not surprisingly that the the um, event groups that have got better representation from participants we've also finding we've got more coaches from ethnically diverse communities right so we have an organization called the coaches association which is just shy of seven thousand members so I can tell you exactly what the makeup of those was at our last census or our last, which was 2017. What I can't tell you about is all the people that might do coaching on a Friday night who are qualified, but they don't, they're not a member of the uh, 
coaches association so in the coaches association we've got 91 percent of white four percent south asian and one percent of black and it's split in male female 96 percent a male and four percent a female however that's changing really quickly it's part of my role is to change that um on our most recent coach development course 27 percent were either black or asian the female representation was around about 10 percent that's starting to grow but uh, it is changing um and i'd say we i couldn't give you data on everyone that coaches we've got 66,000 people registered on our iCoach cricket platform but those could be from all around the world so that's a, that's open access so the, the closest i can get to accurate data is the ca membership hello it's kobe phoning from sporting communities hi, kobe. hi how are you yeah good good i'm glad so I'm just phoning today to welcome you onto the Coaching for All project. Uh, no way. Yeah, you're excited. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. That's great news. The Coaching for All program engaged with 30 coaches from a range of different sports disciplines and coaching experiences. But none of the participants had been an actual paid coach. The learners were from 14 different sports disciplines, covering a total of 18 nationalities. Now to get some insight from the sporting community staff and partners of the project. Hi, I'm Ed Schreier, I work for Sporting Communities. I'm the Derbyshire Development Officer and for this project um, I was the lead alongside Dave um, and my role was really designing the content, helping deliver the project and really assisting the participants uh, in any way possible. Hi, I'm Dave Smith, I'm one of the deliverers for the Coaching for All project. Uh, my background is in sports performance and strength conditioning, where I'm my own sports performance company. <clears throat> and I got brought into this project to help uh, design, write and deliver uh, the multi-skills coaching qualification. So I'm Kobe and I used to be a coach at Sporting Communities and I was also the marketing officer. And my role in this Coaching for All project was just being support and helping people throughout. So I spoke with a lot of the participants on the project, so I kept them and help motivate them throughout the project. And I also helped with their assessments. So I did a lot of the phone calls and just keeping contact with them, touching base and seeing their progress and helping them and seeing if they had any questions really. Uh, my name is Esther Jones. I work for UK Coaching. I'm the diversity and inclusion officer. At uh, UK Coaching, we're the leading uh, UK's charity uh, for sports and physical activity coaches. Uh, we believe that great coaches can change lives and that coaches are the heartbeat of sport and physical activity. Uh, our main support in the project has been uh, providing guidance to uh, the staff to help them design some of the programme, um, providing guidance on a return to co uh, coaching uh, post COVID and lockdown one. And uh, that was quite crucial. Um, and also we've um, done some work in terms of providing access to coach developer support and this has been a recent pilot that we've done, uh, testing the value of coaching conversations um, for people who are uh, becoming coaches and are coaches uh, to help them work through their coaching journeys. Hi, I'm uh, Aaron Kang. I'm the CEO of Sporting Equals. Um, I've been at Sporting Equals for a number of years now. Sporting Equals um, had a number of um, roles that we played uh, with uh, this um, uh, project. One of those was about training and workshops. So we were helping to develop the content on the, um, for the training. Uh, but also, um, I remember delivering um, some training as well around Black Lives Matter, uh, as well as race equality. Uh, we helped with case studies, preparing case studies um, with some of the participant experiences that we picked up. Okay, so my name's Caroline Mason. I'm a senior lecturer at Loughborough University and I was involved with this project as part of the evaluation team, um, looking to learn from the project as an external evaluation team. Why do you think that is important that ethnically diverse coaches are presented at a paid level and not just voluntary? Uh, well, Sport England, we recognise there are many deep-rooted inequalities within the workforce. Uh, we, we believe it's important to better understand 
the current lived experiences of ethnically diverse individuals and why they're underrepresented in page coaching. We want to do this so we can get a clear picture of the challenges and issues they currently face, raise awareness to the wider sector from which to hold honest conversations about why that is, and yeah, and begin to consider ways in which we can collaboratively address those problems. That's that's why this particular piece of work is really important, is to start to open up that conversation and make sure it's a conversation that's had with others. We know our, our data and insight from other partners says that coaching at an entry level, which is primarily voluntary, is pretty diverse. But it's when you dig into that data and particularly when you start to consider progression of coaches or paid roles, then you're absolutely right. That diversity starts to wane. It starts to disappear. So I think it's really important that we increase the visibility of ethnically diverse coaches right across the pathway. So whether they're working in community or, or in talent spaces, so that they're inspiring and in future generations and ensure our sector is far more inclusive than it currently is in relation to paid opportunities. I read an article only this morning, actually, um, about how black and Asian individuals in particular being disproportionately impacted by COVID in terms of in unemployment across, across the country. So it's just shouting out even more that we've got to do more to change these trends. And from this perspective, at a coach level, at an organizational level, but but at a system level, because those are inequalities are clearly still still there. So yeah, it's great that um, it's quite diverse when you come into coaching, but then there's a whole load of barriers presented for different groups in terms of moving forward, accessing opportunities, receiving the right training in the right way that meets them. That that is why it's really important that we we I suppose start to understand what it looks like for for paid positions. We're really passionate about making sure that that uh, coaching is representative of, of the population of the UK and of the people that are accessing uh, coaching and, and sport and physical activity. And, and we know that it's really important um, uh, that co uh, how in co important coaches are, sorry, in helping people to stay active and get involved in um, physical activity and progress in a sport if they, if they want to. And as a coaching sector, we're missing out if we're not able to attract the widest knowledge, skills and experience into coaches. So we need to make sure that we have a wide representation of people in coaches. Um, and now again, our own research shows how important it is that coaches understand people that uh, who they are coaching and that they're able to relate to them. So again, we know that people from similar communities and or similar life experiences can empathise and support people in their activity goals and also sporting endeavours. And it's our opinion that coaches are critical um, to getting people more active and back into sport and physical activity, um, you know, post lockdown. You can't be what you can't see. You know, these role models will be inspiring another generation of coaches in the future. And so that's what we really want to be um, uh, uh, pushing on as well. There's also going to be improved understanding. I think um, at a paid level, um, it's unequal in numbers. Uh, compared to the population and so it's really important to have a more a fair and just approach to this uh, and and you know it, it it's it, there's a business case to diversity here as well it's about um, getting the most um, talent that we can a wider pool of talent right across our sports and to do that we need diverse coaches coming through the system um, and to do that we need people who have that empathy to the barriers and challenges facing many communities and sometimes we don't have that it's very difficult to really work with individuals or work with those communities as well. How do you think the findings of the project are going to help support more ethnically diverse coaches into a sporting career? Uh, what I suppose what we believe that this project can help with, I think it's going to demonstrate to organisations across the sector, particularly those that are providing training to the coaching workforce, that there are specific approaches, specific tactics, if you like, that lend itself to, you know, inclusive recruitment that I know sporting communities have spoken to, to me about on a number of different occasions. Then the way in which they go and develop those individuals that aligns to 
the challenges in their life and their context. So it's not just a one size fits all. And then, of course, um, supporting their deployment, you know, their opportunities to go and be a coach within their local uh, communities. And I think that's going to influence the sector, the coaching sector, to really rethink, re-engineer the way it presents opportunities to ensure that they, you know, I'm um, using your words, Curtis, appeal and attract to all, in, in particularly ethnically diverse individuals. What methods did you use to conduct the project's research? Okay, so what we did in the beginning is we conducted a survey with all the participants in the programme and we also followed up with some of those coaches to find out a little bit more in depth about their experiences. So we did telephone interviews. Um, now we're reaching the end of the programme. We have done, uh, we're going to repeat the survey to see if anything's changed and to see um, what participants think they've gained through their experiences. We're also doing focus groups with two groups across the two different um, locations, so Stoke and Derby. And the focus groups have got two elements to them. One is focusing on their experiences. What shall we do in the future as a result of undertaking this project? What could change in the future? In addition, we have some interviews planned for um, 14 communities to give them their chance to also reflect on their experiences. What were you hoping to learn from the research conducted? I mean, ultimately, the programme was designed to try and learn about um, how we can encourage um, a much more diverse coaching workforce. So the research itself was very much focused on um, that kind of insight so not only what did the coaches do and what did they experience but how can that enhance future programs and try and make try and encourage a much more diverse coaching workforce because we know that in terms of paid coaching um, certain groups are very much underrepresented in paid coaching in particular. So what challenges did you have with recruiting for the project? So one of the things at Sporting Communities that we pride ourselves on is our staff's a bit, uh, their ethos and their values, their principles. And when we go into communities that are ethnically diverse uh, with our, our team, we break down barriers around who, it, you know, the fact that it doesn't matter what you look like or where you're from, it's about the person that you are. And that then becomes reciprocated in those uh, social development changes. When it came to recruiting for the Great Ideas Project, we weren't actually able to go out and face-to-face -face recruit uh, for the program because we got hit by the start of the pandemic. So we relied a lot on our partners trying to recruit people for us and also going through social media. Now, with the challenges with that were that we weren't selling the program as, as much as we could have done ourselves and being able to go out there and actually tell people about the, the benefits of the program. And also social media is quite a hotspot for um, people with quite um, varied opinions. And we did get a little bit of backlash from those so certain individuals who maybe thought that there shouldn't have been a, prog a research program specific for understanding ethnically diverse barriers. And so that was some of our challenges at the time. Uh, but as the program grew and we, we got a cohort of, of individuals, the word spread soon that the program was a positive one and we were able to then recruit up to the number that we, we were, were targeting. I think keeping the learners that we had initially on the project was really important, like I've mentioned, but having them um, advertise almost the project for us um, to certain friends and family members worked really well. So we ended up get, gaining, I think, six or seven participants just from the initial participants through uh, them telling their friends and family about it. So that worked really well as well. There now follows a ministerial broadcast from the Prime Minister. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. What was the impact of the coronavirus and how did you adapt to the pandemic? So coronavirus was a big shock to us all and it really changed the way that we had to deliver the programme. Initially, the idea was about uh, understanding the participants journey throughout the 12 month programme where we would help them to develop as coaches, signpost them into volunteering and paid employment opportunities, and then track their journeys with their, uh, them giving almost like a diary of their uh, experiences, positive and uh, negative. And those practical skills that they would have learned 
from our team would have been invaluable to them than developing into those roles. Unfortunately, that's not uh, been able to take place. But we were conscious to make sure that we didn't let the participants down by not delivering the project or delaying it. So instead, we converted the program to an online platform uh, where participants were able to suggest the time that was best suited for, for them and on then the uh, evening slots when uh, the program ran, we delivered uh, Zoom uh, programs to engage with them and, and share the learning that they would have done in the classroom. Now, initially we changed some of the order of the program just to allow for us to do some practical where we would be able to. However, unfortunately, throughout the course of the year, we've been unable to do that other than on one occasion. So. Whilst the participants haven't had the practical experience that they've been able to do in the sense that we would have done it all together previously, we have set them challenges to work from from home. Uh, they've done coaching to the rest of the participants in their gardens or in their backyards or on parks. Um, and that's been a great experience as well. It's, it's helped the coaches to become really adaptable and think innovatively about the way that they would then engage participants when they're actually able to go out and coach. What is the structure of the project? Could you tell us about any of the changes and adaptions made throughout? All right, so the structure of the project, it was originally designed to be delivered over one year. So we put together six modules of content that would take uh, a novice coach or a, a non-coach all the way through to a practicing coach. And this included a wide variety of topics that were what we deemed relevant to what a new coach would need to succeed as a coach. It was all based around a multi-skills um, structure, so then they had and obtained the skills necessary for them to coach in any environment and setting, which we thought was really important for their development. The project was supposed to be run face-to-face, -face, so in a classroom setting and a field-based setting, but we weren't able to do this with COVID-19, so we took the whole course online. This is where we delivered remotely via Zoom and other, other platforms. But this gave us the opportunity to work closer with our partners like UK Coaching, where they come on board and delivered uh, on our behalf um, more CPD courses, which was really great and, and worked out really well for the participants. Uh, it also allowed us to bring in you know, more guest speakers and cover more content and get more insight into other people's coaching journeys, which we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do if we'd have delivered face to face because we've had coaches from all over the country all over the country from different sports delivering, which just wouldn't have been feasible if we had to remain uh, in a classroom setting face to face. OK, guys, so now we can hear from the coaches involved from the project. Hi, I'm Miriam. So I'm looking to do a coaching um, to coach karate. My name is Al Hassan Kwasau, uh, African from uh, West Africa, Nigeria. Um, I started uh, football at the age of two, three. In UK, people do call me Keita. Uh, I'm a black belt stand down in Judo. I'm a Judo fighter. I started Judo in 1998 in Guinea. So uh, I participated in uh, so many competitions in Africa, Guinea, outside Guinea. I've been in the Olympic 2012 in uh, in London. Um, so my name is Jade Shreya and I've coached rugby and play rugby. My yes. name is Ali Latif. Sometimes I don't feel some of the uh, categories um, uh, identify me. So I always put other, the reason being I'm from Kashmir. Um, so, and there's no, I know it says Asian other, because it says Asian Pakistani, Asian Indian, but it doesn't say Asian Kashmiri. So I'm Kashmiri, but I do put Asian other. My main sport is badminton. So could you tell me what your motivation was for applying for the course? When I was working in the, in the, in the, in the um, I was working in the youth services and um, one of the things I found important was to keeping up with the uh, continuous professional development. Because I think that kept your mind going and also kept you updated with with what was happening. Um, and one of the reasons for well, two or three reasons really. Um, one, I hadn't been on a coaching course since I did my badminton level one, 
And again, I think that must have been around 16, 15, 16, possibly plus years ago. Um, I, have, I hadn't done anything since then. And like I said, I haven't formally, formally coached uh, in a paid capacity. And so I thought one is going to get me involved with interacting with other people, with other coaches. So we obviously learn from each other. Secondly, it'll give me a qualification um, in, the, in, the quali- in the coaching sector, not directly linked to badminton, but a generic general um, coaching um, qualification. Um, and like I said, three was was it's about you know keeping a mind fresh and keep keeping um, in touch with with what's going on, the latest things. And I think with these with these courses, and it was free. I think to be honest, that's one of the motivating factors as well. It was free. Um, and um, and I thought, why not? I applied, and um, I knew Ed from badminton, and, I, and it, it was mentioned. Uh, I, I jumped at the opportunity, to be honest. Yeah, my 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 method. First of all, when I come to this country, my uh, my plan was uh, to carry on doing the same sports, give the experience, uh, some experience that go to other people who need it, and. Uh, eventually do some more competition. But uh, unfortunately, it didn't go that way. Then I changed my mind to at least give some some of my uh, uh, experiences I, I go around the world or from other uh, coaches to other people who need it in this country, especially in Stockholm trend. So that, that, that pushed me to go uh, do some uh, Training, learning about being a coach in in UK. So that's that's the one who motivated me to to start this uh, to join this course to help communities to support them in sport ways. Um, it was advertised because I'm at university. It was advertised through our university emails, um, and I sent Ed an email to say what what's the course about sort of thing. Um, and he called me and just gave me like an overview of what it sort of would be, like how long it would be, what would we be talking about. Um, and like, you know, asked if I had any questions or anything. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity to develop my knowledge already and like maybe go through some stuff that we talked about at university. Um, and it's also been nice because I knew it'd give me the opportunity to discuss like coaching experience with, you know, loads of different people. I am looking at developing, you know, a career um, as a paid coach in the future uh, and also um, a, a basic knowledge of a formal knowledge of, of, of the game so that, you know, I would be able to guide um, young talents um, adequately to, to attain their, the fullness of their potential. So I've reached a point in karate where um, I want to help others and I want to develop and help them along their journey to be um, to grow and be a better version of themselves in karate and also help them to get their black belts. But I did struggle with the transition to become to move from a student to a coach. And it's more my own confidence why I struggled with that. And I saw this opportunity to do the sports leadership course and I took it because I saw it's an opportunity to help me. Yeah. for it to move to take that step from coach, student to coach have you previously coached in a voluntary capacity before i have yeah when i did the um i did the level one uh baob level one i had to pay for that i think at that time i think it was around 300 plus pounds uh, i haven't worked over the nine years i took redundancy nine years ago um and um but i've um, been doing a lot of voluntary work both in terms of Badminton, as well as away from badminton, um, I'm part of an organisation <coughs> organization that's um, supporting orphan children in Kashmir. But <coughs> in terms of badminton, um, I have been coaching, but again, I've not been. It's not been in a paid capacity as such. I still play competitive badminton, and and I believe I'm good, <laughs> but I needed the qualification. Yes, I, I did. I, I, I did uh, with uh, when I came in Stoke, uh, I was uh, training uh, a team called uh, Snead Judo Club. I was training them 
uh, two twice a week before before um, before I was moved before I moved, they moved me to Birmingham. So I was training them and uh, I host their their level. Their level was a bit low. So as soon as I started with them, we start doing competition, getting more medals. Medals. So all the the participant, the athletes, all the athletes was very very happy for me to be there. So I did it here. I did it back home. Yeah, so I've done a lot of voluntary coaching at the university. Um, I also volunteered for long eat and rugby for like the girls, the under like under 16 side. Did that for quite a while. Young groups, you know, back home in Nigeria and uh, also here, you know, uh, just um, getting young lads together and, you know, um, guiding them through just as a matter of interest. No, I haven't, and mainly because I didn't realise there were opportunities available out there to do so. Prior to the course, what prevented you from becoming a paid coach? <clears throat> well, uh, I didn't have the formal qualifications, so I wouldn't venture to say I want to go into paid coaching. If there was a, a provision for something like apprenticeship, I didn't know anything, and I didn't know how to go about it. And so this uh, course has given me the, the 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 advantage of understanding how things work, and I've got people because of this uh, um, um course. I've got people now that at least I could uh, go to and and have a chat if I've got any ideas. There wasn't a lot of paid coaching opportunities at the time, and I didn't really want to branch off and take a job and then you know not have any hours and be getting paid like twenty quid a week. Um, which I know a lot of the people that were coaching rugby at the time were getting paid. So I sort of just left it for a bit. Yeah, I mean, I've been a voluntary boxing coach for just over six years. Um, I'm a level one boxing coach. Mm -hmm. been coaching under 14s, like I say, for almost seven years now, actually. Not having the information where to go to try and find paid, paid work for a start. Um, I wasn't the best of kids growing up and I've got a bit of a criminal record. So I yeah. thought that would also I thought that'd also prevent me from getting it. But um yeah. like I say, like with the voluntary side of things at the boxing, it's made it it's made it more of a reality of me being able to become a paid coach. So uh, after I've done my assistant coach uh, uh, course, uh, I was continuing helping on voluntary basis. But to be honest, um I don't know, maybe it's something uh, like a um and inside the politics, uh, sometimes uh, either you have to be, I don't know, fully available or sometimes, uh, obviously, as an ethnic minority, I feel like uh, I'm not uh, always very welcome. Um, so pretty much was the qualification and then uh, the background. Uh, it may be in my accent sometimes. So mm. it's, a, it's a blend of different, uh, you know, factors. Just didn't get the the opportunity, I guess. Um, well, I was also like uncertain about like whether I want to be a coach. So, um, so not, nothing really prevented me. It just um, it just myself who, which I didn't really um try to um look for it that much. Each of the learners undertook an outcome store assessment to track their journey and development throughout the program. This enabled them the opportunity to reflect on their work and also share their experiences. We also assigned mentors to each learner to support them on their learning journey. So I'm looking at your outcome star now. You should be really proud of yourself. Right. You've made some excellent progress. Just gotta keep at it yeah, yeah, it's just a case of keeping it up. Oh, really pleased. Yeah, exactly. And I'm here to support you the whole way. So if you have any questions, just drop me an email or even give me a phone call. Thanks, Kobe.
different guest speakers on. Um, that was really inspirational for the participants and because we had, we, well, we were very lucky to have who we had on, um, I think that was really um, inspiring for them and they didn't know who, was gonna, who we were going to get next. So um, why did you agree to guest speak for the project today, Donna? Oh my gosh, so I, I think I spoke on with this group uh, back in April last year and for me I think it's really important to be that positive voice. I'm in the administration side of my sport and, and to be a role model myself that it is possible for, for those who look like me to get into roles such as what I'm in now but also into the coaching. So the relationship that I had with my coach, it's really important to shine the spotlight on such coaches. And this project is doing that because there are some great individuals who are coaching out there that don't get the recognition that they absolutely deserve. So if I can be that catalyst platform to speak from the rooftops and challenge and, and just be that positive voice, I think it's really important to, to support such projects as yours. You've got more muscle than me, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, have you ever tried bench press before or so, oh yeah that was part, that's why i didn't like weight training i've got long levers so bench well, press is not easy for me well, you've had to become in my coach now then <laughs> so I can make a comeback I, I, pro I probably would yeah and i'll inspire you to push yourself to the absolute limits no pain, oh my no gosh no see see i've had in, in too many years of that <laughs> but, but, but said, so why did you choose to become a coach so I look back, I think, you know what? I always remember Billy Pike was my coach, right? And he, he was like my, my surrogate dad, right? And he went to me, right? And he was, but he was a traveler from the traveling community, very direct, but fair and firm. And he went, right, well, you even got money. He's in front of everyone. You haven't got any money, have you? Again, when, uh, we had, it was only 50 pence, but 50 pence was a big thing in, um, in 1979. <laughs> it's a big thing, do you know what I mean? And I said, no. And he went, right, I tell you what, you come down and help me train the beginners, the new kids, and then you can train for free. So because I tell you, life's about giving and taking. And I learned at 10, 11 years old, I learned about volunteering. And I learned about nothing comes for free and about giving and taking. I'll give you an hour. You give, I'll, give, I'll train you for an hour. You train them for an hour. Or, you know, give and take. You know what I mean? And volunteering as well, because he was volunteering like I do now. Do you know what I mean? There's big lessons you learn. You don't realise it when you're young, but you just and you just do it, do it. And then it's part of your culture and it's part of your, yeah, because I ain't got a pain, man. I just do it. I'm a volunteer. But one thing is, is the coach was, I can tell now because I'm older, I look back. That bloke, Billy Pike, was the, um, you know, when you turn over, I want to be like him. My first male role model was Billy Pike. I thought, I want to go out there. Do you know what I mean? And once I got, as a kid, once I got into my head what I wanted to do, that was it. You know what I mean? Team, um, first of all, I'm absolutely delighted. Thanks for the invitation. You know, um, as I've been doing a few things with England Boxing and for UK coaching. We spoke differently, we looked differently, it's quite difficult. Sport changes lives, it changed mine. Not only did I find some people who took me in, but... Um, it gave me a new confidence, a new courage. And I, I always remember as a young kid, my first marijuana role model, because we didn't have, you know, I didn't have a dad and that type of thing. They all split up. So I remember at 13 years old, 11 before that, about 10, 11 years old, the first marijuana role model I had was that boxing coach. You know, when you see a bloke, you think, I want to be like him. That's exactly how it was. Showed through determination and strong will what can be done, you know, what can be achieved, and, yeah. and you know, <laughs> Hats off to you, mate. Yeah, amazing, amazing experiences. I just wanted to say, um, to salute to you, really. I say, well, go on, in it, because you know, see, I feel a Caribbean. <laughs> I went to boxing coaching, um, so obviously, towards the element of boxing career, my amateur boxing career. And I suppose I got into it because my boxing coach at the time, Brian Hinkley, who was one of Great Britain's top coaches at the time, um, it was like a second father to me. Literally, it was like a second father to me. And I presume I wanted to follow in his footsteps. Obviously, a bit later on, I got into fitness coaching. But at that time, it was natural development for me to go from being an amateur boxer to an amateur boxing coach and following Brian's footsteps. Get coaching. Just do it. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just do it.
you know you're helping them and you know and they and they you you get so much you get so much from it even if there's only one even if there's only one that that absorbs everything and goes on to be a success and i don't just mean being a top karate kid i mean generally in in whatever you're coaching them it's just nice thinking about psychologically and the psychological aspect of just trying to get out of the, the mindset of not being able to achieve the stuff that you want to when you've been knocked down a couple of times. Yeah, but you just got to get over that. You're never going to, you're never going to achieve it if you don't try, you know, so you could, you can sit at home and not go out and try. What are you achieving? Nothing, nothing. You know what I've always said? I've always said anybody can turn around and say no. I'll take no for an answer. I don't care. I'm just going to keep going. Someday is going to be a yes. You have an option. You can either sit on your ass and do nothing, or you can get up and keep trying, and you may get a few no's, but eventually you'll get a yes. Don't give up. Don't give up. If you love it, if you love it that much, if you love it that much, you won't give up. You'll keep trying. You'll keep trying. And you know what? In life, we want to do things that we love to do and if you love to do something that much you will not give up you won't give up trying so the next time we have a talk i want to hear that you've been knocking at the door okay thank you all right because you can you can there's no such thing as you know learning more about the project i think if it can actually uh, encourage more people from the BEM community to kind of get involved in in sport you actually you get more out of it than you realize like to be able to help people get active and have fun I didn't realize the reward the rewarding aspect of it as much as I do now and it's something like if I could reverse time uh, and probably in hindsight understand the kind of benefits coaching has brought to me not just to the community I probably would have done it years ago um so uh, Muslim women um we don't touch most those that tend to practice prefer not, don't tend to show their hair to men so I wanted to go netball but uh, most of the netball um, facilities and um, uh, organizations that were present in Derby all of them um, uh, had men kind of in the vicinity I used to love netball as a child but because of uh, of the fact that I couldn't play it um, uh, in in Derby where or couldn't find a venue in Derby where I could actually take off my hijab and play I just gave it up. So I would definitely say what I've got from coaching is very different to what I've got from pharmacy, although both are very kind of caring. Um, you see the impact of coaching, not only physically, but also socially, emotionally. Um, and that's really, really satisfying. So I believe even the best coaches experience barriers. Did any of our guest speakers face any barriers? And if so, how did you overcome them? The barriers to coaching, as in like for me becoming a coach, no, I didn't. Once I decided I wanted to do the coaching, there were no barriers there at all. Um, barriers of when I became a coach and tried to set up sessions for the women, that was there was a few barriers there because um, some places that I contacted didn't actually understand that we needed a no-male environment. So that was a barrier in providing the women the sessions that we wanted. Um, so not necessarily a barrier to becoming a coach. Um, while turning to coaching, actually, I didn't experience any issues while turning to coaching. Um, personally, I believe sport's colorblind. You know, during sport, when you're involved in sport, a lot of people, because you're competing against each other, you earn each other's respect. So I believe people see you for a sports person and for nothing else. You know, the issues tend to come from parents or from from fans, you know, that type of thing, or even backroom staff, but not those generally involved in a particular sport. That's my outlook or my experience on it anyway. The guest speakers were a fantastic addition to the project and really helped to motivate and inspire the coaches with their stories and experiences. Uh, I liked the, the guests. Um, so uh, we have people uh, talking about their experiences um and uh, uh, issues uh, barriers to to for success um that was quite motivating i didn't find just one speaker i found them all inspirational in their own way because they had their own journey 
no two journeys are the same and it was really interesting to see to hear each guest speaker and the journey that they took and you take bits of it for yourself but it, one of the key messages I took was they were all their authentic self they were themselves they created that journey for themselves so a key learning point for me is is to create that journey for myself and be my authentic self and not to be somebody else um I really liked Annie I thought she was really funny really charismatic she really had a good way of addressing like her experience of football coaching and all of that sort of stuff um, she really went into like the barriers that she's had, which, you know, I've heard from so many women that I know in sport and especially from, you know, being a Mus- black and Muslim woman as well. Um, I thought that was really interesting. And she was really just open and honest with the stuff that she had going on like in her career. It was because um, I liked his, um, his vibes, like his motivation. So I think it's important to have like really good energy to be a coach. And then I, I really liked his energy and that was like inspirational. I feel that it's, it's really important to have those point of views in terms of this, uh, this course because we see it's real. Like <laughs> well, what I always say, like it's, even if you have the theory, even if you learn all the theory, then you need to check it's real, it's happening, and that people are giving like their, their experiences and just so yeah, I, I think that definitely it was a boost to this uh, to this course. And my favorite part was those guys, those uh, the hosts, especially because she was a not just an Asian female, which is difficult enough to get into, but she was a Muslim Asian female, and I know being you know from that community, it's girls aren't really encouraged to take that route. As, as, a, as a job, you know, they encourage maybe encouraged to do um, whether it's uh, getting to medicine or teaching, whatever, you know, something like that, they're, they're, they're encouraged. But anything else, it's anything around sport, no, no. I also liked the, 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 the introduction of, I'll call them mentors, people to come and talk, you know, and tell you their stories and, and it's encouraging. You see that, oh, this thing you think is an uphill task is actually achievable. Research from the UK Coaching found that the main barriers into coaching for BAME individuals are the balancing of work and home life, the lack of pay and the cost of training. Loughborough's research on the Coaching for All project identified similar results. It also found that over 50% of all coaches had been subjected to a negative experience during their coaching, something which clearly needs to be addressed. What were the key findings from the research, please? Okay, so the research demonstrated that initially many of the coaches were attracted to the course for the um, qualifications that they would be able to do as part of the course and that was a key driver for many of them. Many of them had already been experienced at, uh, as coaches and were looking to develop new skills whereas for some of the coaches they were brand new to um, coaching qualifications. However the data showed that the, as much as the coaches really appreciated the coaching qualifications through their experiences they learned that actually the things that were a benefit to them were much more significant than the coaching qualifications alone. And in particular, what they really benefited from was a network that sporting communities helped them to gain access to. And each of the coaches had a different network that they were interested in gaining access to based on geography and their sport and their age groups, but also the network that they created with the other coaches. So they all really benefited from hearing about other people's experiences. And they all really, really appreciated how much they could learn from each other uh, based on these different um, experiences, but all with the same aspiration to try and get people doing more sport in their local communities. So I think in terms of the project, um, one of the key learnings is that um, online learning for a coaching course is very difficult. And obviously the context required that to happen, but there were some benefits of delivering online. Um, 
it made everybody um, almost sharing um, a particular challenge. So it joined them as, you know, all facing the same challenge together. The sporting community staff were incredibly innovative and determined to make it work. So they really adapted what they did very quickly and really were very imaginative in what they did to try and ensure that coaches had um, a high quality experience. So there were things around the actual delivery of the programme because obviously having an online or an element of online delivery means that you can engage more coaches um, and you're not just restricted to people who are geographically close. So that's an important learning. I think another important um, piece of learning from the research is that many of the coaches found it very difficult to imagine a different way of sport operating that wasn't is more inclusive. So they spoke about um, experiences that they'd had at different sports clubs where they'd wanted to be part of the decision making, part of the committee and things like that. And yet they felt excluded. They weren't necessarily um, it wasn't necessarily made explicit that they were excluded, but they felt excluded. And therefore, many of their children were also excluded um, implicitly from the activities that other children who were who were perhaps less ethnically diverse took for granted. And this really raises questions about how much we can do to, to generate to support a more ethnically diverse workforce if we don't start to think about the broader picture of sport. Um, we can certainly support coaches to be qualified coaches, but the barriers are far more complex than purely the qualifications themselves. And that really, if we genuinely want more, a more um, advanced and diverse coaching workforce, we need to really think about every element of sport being welcoming to people from more diverse communities. And we gave coaches a chance to um, talk about how what things they would like to change. and it was obviously very difficult for them to imagine something different because their experiences have not always been positive. It was very difficult for them to reimagine sport, to be more inclusive, to be more supportive of people from um, diverse communities. Um, and I think that was really important that it, it shows that the people who are most impacted by these inequalities need to be part of the decision making. They need to have their voices heard. And I think, again, this research really showed that sporting communities have empowered um, the coaches to have a voice and to say what matters, and uh, maybe to make us think um, a little bit differently about their experiences. Do you already have a strategy in place to tackle inequalities within your sport? If not, is this something you're looking to address? We, we just well, we have currently 50% gender representation at board level, which we're really proud about that that is, is equal now. And we, we've got it, needs some improvement, but we do have uh, a disabled board member as well. So we've improved our representation at board level and um, still underrepresented when it comes to LGBT um, community and, and, and that. Um, but it's much easier for us to be specific because we've got 12 board members and we understand you know their information um, when it comes to the the wider sport which is you know hundreds of thousands of people focusing on the governance of the of the sport and that's a requirement of the of the, the code but as an organization we've now you know broadened that out to kind of all decision making roles within the sport so it includes coaches um you know as well as our board members paid staff and sort of council members so that that action plan sets out you know which of the where the inequalities lie what we want to focus our resources on because um we we know if we try and do everything all of the time uh, we'll spread ourselves too thinly so where are the, the the biggest issues within within the sport um and then how we plan to do that and part of that has actually been um, continuing to because it's not it's not new for us but to embed this within our wider strategy so we don't have a, a sort of separate um, strategy for diversity it's fully embedded within our organizational strategy yeah um, I was appointed in 2017 I'd say it was in the top two of my priorities of changing the diversity of our workforce um, that plan has been it took me about six months to do the research probably another six months to set it up and get it going. 
and it's probably been running now for two and a half, three years. Um, and it's a robust plan and it's now fully funded. So it's starting to show results that our uh, representation on our courses is going up significantly. I mean, really is. We've got, we've gone up from about three to 4% ethnic diversity to 27 to 30%. Um, and our applications, that's really pleasing. That's gone up uh, 500%. So loads more people. Uh, the plan isn't finished. It's it's being developed all the time. So we're just bringing in some new ideas like um, some things called um, scholarships. So previously, the plan was we'd fund someone on a bursary. We'd give them a lot of money. That would get them on the first course. But of course, that didn't get them to the course. It didn't get them an opportunity. It didn't get them onto the next course. It didn't help them with travel. It didn't help them with kit. So the scholarship is a four-year sustainable program, fully funded, which will mean that people from our three strategic groups, which is um, South Asian, Black, female and disability, they will get the opportunity not only to start the program, but then get uh, support to get onto the next program. And this is really important. They get opportunities made available to them to go and coach and meet up with other role model senior coaches they get kit um, and they also get their own mentor to support them on that journey so it's a it's it's now set up as a four-year program based on the finding of the research would you look to make any change when it comes to policy recruitment and employment within your organization yeah i think i think we would because we've not had clear guidance as yet as to what what we can do about it or how we go about it so so i think you know based on what it says we'd obviously like want to go through it but yeah i think it would lead to us making changes at some point yeah and we the, the thing is for us we've got to be constantly evolving um if the last year has taught us anything is whatever you thought was right yesterday may not be right tomorrow so whilst we're pursuing a plan if this research comes out and shows us new ideas, new thoughts, or says you've got it wrong, then we would listen to that, adapt it. Because ultimately, um, it's not about us, it's about the people we coach. So um, we want to hear any research. We'll read it. We'll take it on board. We'll discuss it with our stakeholders and coaches and say, look at this. This is interesting. What have you thought about this? And we regularly, uh, we have a, a coach development consultation group which is a, a group of diverse coaches, practitioners in the field. And we anything we're going to do, we take to them. We say, what do you think? Here are some ideas. We listen to their feedback. So this is just another example of listening to research feedback outcomes and then saying, well, how can we pick this up and make ourselves better? There does appear, as you say, to be a disproportionate impact uh, of the virus upon BME uh, communities in the UK. And we've also seen that in some other countries around the world as well. So the impact of COVID on our course, um, it wasn't just on the delivery of the course, but it was also the participants. And you have gotta understand that we're working with human beings and this isn't a corporate America setting. We're here to, to develop um, community coaches who go into their own communities to develop them. And so we had to look at their own, their own needs as well. And with COVID, uh, a couple of them over the period of the course have contracted COVID. Uh, and so for a couple of weeks, you know, there was a few of them that, that were ill with it. Uh, also alongside that, a couple of the family members of our participants sadly passed away, which also has a huge impact on, on you know, the, the, their family structure and, and also their involvement in the course where we had to be flexible and allow them to have some time off. Um, you know, some of them took a couple of months away from the course and then come back and picked it up at a later date. Um, you know, we, um, of course, we, we were fine with that and flexible because it's 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 just part of the uh, the process, our learning process, and it was all new to us dealing with this pandemic. Um, also, alongside it, have people and our participants had problems with work. You know, many people were on furlough. Uh, some being self-employed had to um, sacrifice their own companies uh, going forward over the last year. And, and some of them since 
were coming out of lockdown have, have spent more time working to build their company back up, which, which again is something we, you know, we didn't expect to have to deal with. But as as it's come along, we've had to be flexible in our delivery and also understand that that they've got other priorities in their life, which which um, we try to to uh, kind of roll with. So we talked in length about the Black Lives Matter movement uh, that was happening during the project and the impact it was having both on the participants and wider society. And this really helped, um, you know, discussions through some of the workshops around promoting equality. Having them gain that insight was really important because a part of it was them realising what was involved and whether coaching was right for them. Uh, and it really just had to get across you know how difficult it can be to be a, uh, to be a really great coach um, so that was really important and it opened up the conversations for them asking myself and Dave and the guest speakers um, any questions they had around um, around coaching and and any queries they had I think you know like I said growing up I didn't really have anyone teaching coaching anyone you know in those sorts of fields that I knew that came from the same background so I think for me, that's been really important. And I think working with children so far, you know, a lot of them haven't like seen anyone like me or met anyone like me, even been at school with someone like me. And, you know, they ask you different questions and they ask you about your parents and your upbringing and stuff. Um, and I think that's really important, giving them that opportunity, you know, whether it is girls or boys or whatever that look like me, them having that opportunity to see me and, you know, have that representation or whether it's just anyone else that, you know they're not from the same background and they have that opportunity to ask me questions I think is really good that's part of the reason I sort of want to have that balance between teaching and coaching to have like you know the whole all-round experience of just like you know giving them as much time to get to know me I guess as possible. At this point as well UK coaching had just developed uh, the duty to care badge so with the participants all having UK coaching subscriptions we were able to use this as a bit of a pilot really for the participants on the project and tailor some of the content and the workshops around them hitting uh, their duty to care badge. Um, so that again worked really well and that was one of the benefits um, of having a partner like UK Coaching on the project. Um, so there's five um, distinct pillars within the duty to care, which is safeguarding, inclusion, diversity, well-being, and mental health. And we hope that this toolkit, which is a series of, of knowledge checks and learning and development uh, resources and also online courses, will provide coaches with the knowledge and skills um, to support great coaching experiences, as well as support coaches um, to look after themselves. Uh, and we focus here on, on well, uh, well-being and mental health of coaches as well. And we've developed this toolkit with key industry support across the coaching sector. And because we know great coaching is just beyond the kind of technical and tactical elements. Now on the surface, the next question may seem very simple, but getting into it to become a reality is a lot more difficult. What would you think the ideal coaching workforce might look like? So I think it's, it's the best coaching workforce will reflect the community it works in. So I think if you think about coaching, you know, for me, coaching is all about communication because you know, the, the technique of how to do any sport is in a textbook and anyone can go and read that. But you, that doesn't mean you're going to be great at that sport. It's that that coach that can get that idea over to you in a way that that lands and resonates. That's what great coaching does, I think. And I think if the, the best comms are those that come from people that, that are from your your neck of the woods, if you like. So your your community. And, and I think the coaching workforce has to reflect that. Uh, that one I think is really simple. It should reflect your playing representation, and that's what we're working towards. So if you've got twenty, if you've got thirty percent South Asian players, you should have thirty-one percent South Asian coaches. That's a really simple way to identify what I think it should look like. Doesn't say we're there, but that's what we're working towards. Yeah, I think ideally you want a real range of ages. Uh, backgrounds. Um, I think it's very powerful Harry coaching other adults with learning disabilities and children with Down syndrome. What a fantastic role model. But beyond that, Harry coaching anyone is um, quite a powerful message, I think, because 
you've got um, you know going with Harry, Chris, and Andrew. Have also got Down syndrome. Some of our older players that might be in their eighties, taking them into sessions in prisons. Brilliant because the, the prisoners, you know, everyone just every, you, the, the labels are dropped. You know, you suddenly you're not someone with Down syndrome. You're not a prisoner. You're not someone in your eighties. It's just Harry, Mary, Michael. Just you're just you're, you're just you. Well, I think for me, the most important thing is that the coach can do the job. Um, and I think that's that's the case in in anyone that you want to uh, have on your on your team, on your workforce. Um, but I think the ideal thing for us is that there's a, a variety of different people. Uh, so when we're going into schools, when we're delivering sessions to people within the club, um, they've got different role models to look up to. So that's been one of the reasons that we've been quite keen to have um more female coaches involved so that there's there's sort of role models for the female sides and I think that's the same um that's the same when we're looking at sort of different ethnic backgrounds as well um be it's it's good that we've got a, a blend of uh black coaches white coaches um different age group coaches things like that um again I think you know one of the areas that that we're not getting very many participants is, is the Asian community and we don't have any Asian coaches. So whether there's a, a direct correlation there, there probably is, you know, there's not that role model perhaps for the for Asian players to, to look at. Do you feel there is a clear pathway for development for coaches to progress within your sport? Yeah, very clear now. Uh, it's, uh, there are um, five key qualification programs which are all aligned to enable you to grow through your progress it's based upon the learning of the coach not where they get deployed so the first step in your in our coaching pathway is not to coach kids it's to develop yourself as a coach and then the coach decides where they want to go and work um, it's that's all been aligned uh, it's been uh, externally audited at, we're in the process of doing that as well to make sure the quality is right and we've also now got aligned CPD so once you've done your first course you can then do your own learning as you're going to prepare yourself for the next course and it keeps growing all the way from foundation support coach which is half day blended with a bit of online learning to a specialist coach which is a two-year blended coaching program. Yes and no so if you want to coach uh, performance rowing then yes absolutely you you come in and you you learn to be an assistant coach and get your level one and then you get your level two so you can run sessions and then you get your level three so you start looking at uh, training programs and performance angles um i think where there can be improvements made is how do you get a, a decent coach qualified for participation um and, and how is that different um and what does that that roadmap for a coach looks like so to give you an example there still really isn't a coaching qualification that looks, from Rowan at least, that looks at communication and how how you can converse with different groups of people. Um, and I think if we can start thinking like that, then there'll be a much clearer pathway for recreational coaching. Based on your knowledge of the current makeup of your coaching workforce, do you think there's a problem with a lack of ethnically diverse coaches? And if so, how do you think initiatives like this project would help? I think this project will definitely help because it targets... Uh, areas where we're looking to grow coaches, particularly in basketball, uh, in, increase the amount of ethnic minority coaches, increase the amount of female coaches. Um, so I think this project can only do real good for basketball in particular and for sporting as well. Um, we've seen uh, there's definitely a, an imbalance in, in basketball in the amount of coaches from an ethnic background, uh, perhaps not as much as, as some sports. And it's something that we'd really like to try to address and basketball's keen to try to increase the amount of coaches from a range of different backgrounds. So hopefully this project will really make a big difference. This doesn't happen overnight. But I think a lot of sport and a lot of community sport needs reimagining and new projects need to start. New, like fresh, new projects that aren't so entangled in the sort of um, the history and tradition and you know steeped in the kind of 
in the table tennis world, you've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of local leagues, which are part of the county table tennis structures, which are part of this national council. And I think people just, and we have, you know, people just need to just step outside of that. And I think if people that are, uh, they care about sort of social justice and, 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 and have a kind of social conscience, if more people with, 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 with that kind of worldview get into sport and, and, and start new projects, then I think that that is how um, this could be improved. Uh, I think there is a lack of uh, diversity. We do not represent the playing group, nor do we represent the national makeup but most importantly, not the playing group. So, yeah, I think there is uh, a lack of diversity. And I think the first step in changing that is it isn't tokenism. That that won't work. In my experience, just getting people from an ethnic background to coach, that won't work. They've got to be people that want to be coaches and are good coaches. Mm. Um, and that way we'll change the way people see diversity. So the way we see it is, if you have a diverse coaching group, you have more opinions. And the whole point of improving performance is that no one person has the answer. So if you have more diversity in your thinking, you're probably going to get better outcomes. And the world of coaching and sport is, is one major element. Not all of it is results. So if, if, if I've got a coaching team who are more diverse and come up with better solutions, my players get better. And if my players get better, they win more. Uh, and although that's not everything, it's one of the key things, particularly at the professional level. If you're winning as a coach, you probably keep your job. And if you're losing, you might not. So how are we addressing that? We're making sure that we're creating greater opportunities for a more uh, diverse group to apply and then giving them a chance to learn. So we're not just um, giving someone a ticket, it's, it's all learned. So when they do get to the, to the situation where they're from an ethnic background, which isn't, isn't as diverse as what we've got at the moment, but they, they're there, we're giving them the opportunity to excel, but also the tools. So they're, they are, they're there for the right reasons. They're there because they're great coaches. And great coaches deliver great results. So they would never be referred to, I would hope, they'd never be deferred, referred to as, oh, you're a diverse coach. No, you're a great coach. You just happen to be from a diverse background. So we've got to give people opportunity and give them support, mentoring, courses, education to enable them to succeed, set them up for that success that they deserve. Um, I think there is a problem. I think for, for what we do, I think there's a problem in that we don't have a, you know, as Fulham Reach, we don't have a diverse workforce at the moment. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a problem, but it's, it's a problem that's difficult to measure because I think it, it's just intuition. Like I think it, 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 if we had a diverse workforce that reflected the young people we were working with, I think it would just remove one of those invisible barriers. And I think maybe it's not about what barriers we can remove but what sort of layers of comfort and confidence we can put around people when they come in the building um and what sort of you know what we want to make it as frictionless as possible that journey into the sport um and so i think by not having a, a workforce that's diverse you create a bit of friction you and I, I can't quite explain how or why but that i think there just is something there that that could be better uh, I, I'd put it that way and I, and I think that's probably across most sports as well um, so I think any any project like this or anything else we can do to try and get those workforces to reflect the people they're working with will ultimately make the journey into the sport and for those participants much easier and then I think over the longer term we'll keep them involved in sport and active more you know for, for longer for, um, for, for more sessions and so that ultimately will, will benefit any, everyone in the long run. Um, so, yeah, the answer to that is yes, I definitely do think um, having uh, course, courses like this to promote the BAME community to get involved in coaching um, is something which I definitely think should be repeated. Um, and I think the project itself is, if it wasn't available, you'd have far less coaches kind of wanting to come into coaching. Um, and I think once you, you get kind of the first cohort through, the next two or three cohorts will probably 
you'll probably find the numbers multiply a lot more because the word is getting out there that these courses are available. Um, so definitely, I do think the course should be repeated. And I think it's great for the BAME community. I totally agree. 100% projects like this should be, you know, made to continue and be funded as best they possibly can and be readily available for, for people of colour, you know, to take part in and ultimately go on to hopefully coaching, you know, because it's, a, it's an amazing thing. It's a great thing and it offers something else that rather than just always playing sport, we can be on the other side of it and people of colour can be coaching it and developing um, some class, some class for the future in whatever chosen sport these youngsters decide to go into. I think we need to clearly understand what the needs are, what's missing for the, for those coaches from an ethnic background. You know, we can't just put things in without understanding the reason behind that. So that's where conversations and projects like this uh, are creating the platform for that. I think whatever is in place, especially in athletics, and I've mentioned our coaching qualifications, we have to look through all of what we are delivering. And is it capturing? Is it accessible? Is it appealing? Is it opening for everyone to, to come forward and want to take up those courses? And whether that's around funding, that's something we need to look at. So it is affordable because, as you know, the whole coaching qualifications can become quite expensive. So projects like this um, are definitely really, really invaluable. So I'm all willing to support where we can. So guys, what would you say you have gained from being involved in the course? Is there anything in particular that you'll use moving forward? My main game at the end is to have an indoor skate park facility in Derby. It's given me a confidence in the sense previously I might have just thought of being narrow-minded, just concentrated on, on the badminton. But what this has given me is actually I'm able to do a bit more. You know, I can, I can be involved in generic, generic uh, sports. If, for example, cycling, I wouldn't have thought I would have been able to do something. But even from my experiences and with the skills I've learned on this course, I'll be able to be encouraged and, and set up a cycling club, for example, or set up a separate um, women's badminton. Whatever the need is within the community, I feel I'd be able to respond. But yeah, I feel I do feel a lot more confident in being able to do that. The challenges that we were given to encourage us to coach others um, and to like develop techniques. So what we were given was a list of activities that we needed to do, and it was to do those activities. Um, and I think that's that was really helpful. To do because I know it sounds like a really silly thing to say, but I would never, I would never have done anything like this. Like even to record myself and put myself out in a WhatsApp group of video of what I've done, I would never have done that. And I think this gave me that opportunity to, to do that, um, that type of thing and put myself out there a little bit more. Well, uh, planning is the most important thing. Prioritizing how to prioritizing will help me to plan properly, and it's all say in plan. Well, um, if you fail to plan, you you plan to fail. So uh, that's that's one thing I, I learned. And um, another thing is that I know exactly which uh, door to knock on if I need any help and. Uh, uh, any guidance and directions. So what I've been doing is with the karate sessions, we've started karate every day in January and I do a session of that, now it's a regular slot where it's every Friday where I lead a session. It's only a small group but it's that stepping stone to get that practical experience and I think that's what I'm going to take is that I've started to develop that confidence to do, to, to lead a session. The mental health side of things, uh, with the coaching of the boxing, it's it's very, very specific around the boxing and it's more injuries than anything else. The mental health side of things, I'd not really learnt about. I mean, I knew little bits and bobs. Gained uh, a much more formal um, way of um, conducting sessions. Um, uh, I've also um, gained um the especially the health and safety bit um before commencement of you know the the training and and, and so on and so forth
thinking that one day I may be able to open a club, my own club. Um, and um, I already had, I already plan actually. Uh, I may have to do something like uh, an elite uh, ethnic minority club for Romanians. Mm -hmm. uh, take them uh, once a month and the meet and eventually uh, bring different experienced coaches as a guest and uh, learn from different uh, top coaches. So now, yes, I would love to do not full-time coaching, but certainly substantial coaching if I, if I, you know, if I can, and I'd love it, absolutely love it. Obviously, you know, like, like I'm mainly more of a weightlifting fitness kind of guy, but I also do a bit of, bo like learn a bit more about boxing as well. If it was part-time, then that, that would probably be reasonably good. This course hasn't, hasn't been mainly about how can I structure my career, about getting out there, but uh, it's also been a start to my pathway. Uh, you gave me, you guys gave me that contact, the contact uh, of, of this guy, my show. Uh, so, appreciate it a lot. Uh, there's no words to uh, to thank for that because it's it's not lots of places where you can get that, uh, and it's it's what what I was looking for. So yeah, because my aim is to start and to give what I learn from day one of my day one of my sport, especially but uh, particularly the course I did. I need to. I get the um, the knowledge, so I need to give to people who need it. So that's my aim. I'm hoping to do my PGC in September, so I'd like to do sort of some sort of like part-time coaching around that, whether it's rugby or just anything, you know, like summer work, maybe like summer camp work or something like that would be great. Uh, I'm not going to say my dream right now. My dream was when I was 16. It was my dream. Right now, it's my goal. Right now, I'm I'm in an elite world, uh, so. I think that from there I'm gonna go up and uh, I, what, what I can promise is that I'm gonna try everything. I'm gonna be there, like working 100%. If I don't get it again, it's because I wasn't meant to be there. But uh, I think it's my thing, it's my passion. And uh, I've, I've gone through lots of handicaps uh, throughout this process with, let's say with family. My mom maybe wanted me to be an economist. Here I am studying coaching. But uh, yeah, I'm trying to get up there. Uh, make my future from coaching and uh, after that make all this future too uh, that's that's what's really gonna what's really gonna make me achieve that goal apart from you know making my career from here just building other careers athletes other coaches other stuff I want to get there but step by step right now I'm, I'm in the first step so yeah step by step With the research stating an underrepresentation of ethnically diverse pay coaches, would it be interesting to know what you think to the impact of having more ethnically diverse coaches? Uh, we believe a representative coaching workforce in, in every community is, is going to relate and attract a greater number of ethnically diverse participants to get and stay active, which is which is fundamental because that hopefully creates a pipeline. Uh, an opportunity to then transition as many do from being a participant into a volunteer or coach so then for the coaches themselves it's going to improve their own mental health their well-being their own personal development um, and hopefully in turn inspires as I said more to follow in their in their footsteps continuing I think one of the important things is breaking down the stereotype of what it is to be a coach because that's something I think this project and many others are changing the dial on it's, it's more about understanding the person in front of you than necessarily the sport or activity you might be coaching. And then lastly, on the wider influence of the project, um, it's about the learnings going some way. So I think I mentioned it earlier to reframing the recruitment and development practices of many organizations and partners, helping the sector shift to become again, a little bit more inclusive, but it's not just not just being inclusive at the start of that journey, like, oh, 
we've we've recruited in a more inclusive way the language we've used the ways which we've engaged the local community it's every step of that journey so as we said earlier we've got a relatively diverse um coaching demographics at an entry level so therefore it's fundamental we do far more to help people meet their motivations as they progress whether that's i don't know moving from community spaces into the talent space for example or helping them to really thrive in their own communities to be the best that they can be so they can be a leader in their own right that that's the fundamental bit it's not just about the entry anymore that's 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 kind of a given to some extent it's about breaking down uh, and meeting the challenges on every stage of somebody's journey. Well, I think, you know, it's going to have a huge uh, impact on sport. I think, um, you know, one of the big things that um, uh, this is going to do is, I think, increase participation across sport um, from grassroots level upwards in, you know, in, in those um, talent pathways as well. I think that's going to be a big impact. Yeah, well, there's a, a number of things, really. Personally, I think there's a saying going around that really resonates with me, which is, if you can see it, you can be it. And I really do believe that, you know, this means different things for different people, but we need to make sure um, that um, people can see people like me at all levels of sport and physical activity um, and all the way through the, the coaching structures as well. So that means people moving into paid positions. It may, means people also moving into... Uh, coach developer, tutor, assessor the roles so that we have uh, representation of um, the community all the way through the coaching workforce. So I think whatever route people want to take in coaching, we, we, we need to make sure that people are able to get into, co into coaching, but also able to progress. That we really need to understand um, the lived experience of people from all communities that are coming into coaching. And what I mean by that is, you know, um, people from different backgrounds, absolutely, people from un underrepresented groups, whether that be from diverse communities, whether that be from uh, low social economic areas. But we also really need to understand the coaching sector needs to keep understanding and keep asking and keep checking what it's like for people to come into coaching, because then we can really understand how we make sure that we make that customer journey, that journey into coaching. Uh, really person-centered and, and really you know as easy as possible for people to access coaching um it'd be it'd be rep it will represent society as we know it um but it's not just and it will it will give um give everyone hope like the next generation like my niece and nephew give them hope that they can go to a sports center where a swimming instructor or netball coach or dance coach instructor looks like them they don't have to be like they don't have to be a like quiet shy timid person because nowadays we live in such a multicultural community society even families now are so complex and multicultural quite even individual families are and we need to start representing that in the workforce but in the wider society in terms of sports parliament education system it's not just sport, but across all industries, we need to represent, be more representative of how we are inside, in our homes and in society. Oh, gosh, that's a huge thing. Um, you know, our society is extremely diverse here in the UK. We need people who represent our society. And from a sporting background, again, I can speak for athletics. Our sport is extremely diverse. So as an organisation, the, the national governing body, that also should reflect the sport that we serve. It doesn't, and we've got a lot of work to do in that space. And that's at all levels, from team management to coaching to um, administration to senior leadership. There's different levels that we need to be representative of the sport that we serve. And just listening to some of, of the athletes that, uh, you know, who are from an ethnic background, you know, they see it, you know, they want to go away on teams knowing that they have that relations who who look like them and can relate to the issues that they're probably experiencing so we are just doing a lot of work behind the scenes at athletics and I know some other sports are doing the same but it needs to be addressed and we've got a lot of work to do. Coaching is kind of coaching is diverse and this is where this is where it all starts it starts from from the lower levels so if we've got youngsters Black, white, Asian, every different culture mixing together, coaching together, coaching together, and they are seen by those youngsters that they are coaching.
those youngsters didn't look and think, oh, it's all right for me as a, as a white kid to mix with a black guy and it's all right for me to, you know, these guys are all right, these guys are helping me. And then you look at them in a different light and these youngsters are going to grow with that kind of thought, with that kind of ethic. Now, hold on a minute, these guys help me. So, you know, everyone's, everyone's all right. It's got nothing to do with, with colour, you know, so it kind of like, it brings us all together. It just brings us all together and what better thing can you do than something that's going to bring people together? I think it's been really good. Like, if, if I could do it again, I'd do it again. And I would like to say, at this point, we've got a lot of work from working with sporting communities and the team and the coaches um, during this time. It's important to say just how much the participants have enjoyed the experience and how, how much they appreciate all the effort that Ed and Dave and the other stakeholders have put into the programme. The conversations that we've had with the participants, they've very much enjoyed the experience and I think, uh, you know, this project has given them the confidence to want to go out and do that and they feel that they are well prepared to do that. Yeah, just for me, this project's been excellent. Massive thanks to Coldo, who has come into our club and been part of the project. And we've seen a huge benefit. He's been excellent in the work that he's done. He's been so motivated. I think the project's really captured his imagination and he's really enjoyed doing doing all the work that he's done for our club